How you doing, AJ? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good. I appreciate you doing this all the way from France. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for uh, having me on. Where are you and what are you doing over there right now? Are you getting ready to race? Are you just training or just watching the tour? Yeah. yeah, just getting ready to race. We're up at Elevation in Tignes, France, so it's like 2,100 meters. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it's quite good training here. Super hard, so yeah. What's uh, How do you do with altitude? Yeah, like this is actually only my second time doing an altitude, but my first time I responded quite well, so I'm hoping I'll have the same uh, same response this time. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Super excited for you. I think, and uh, I'll speak for everyone from Rochester, just super excited about everything that's going on for you. It's really incredible to watch and just, yeah, it, re- yeah. just really pumped, man. Everybody's super hyped. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. It's yeah, it feels good to be representing the cycling community in Rochester. So yeah, hopefully I can keep it going. So let me the first question I want to ask you: How do you? I know you love cross and road, and I was kind of reading through some other pod uh, interviews that you had done. How do you kind of manage both of those? Because that's a huge question for athletes, especially nowadays. Even then, you know, roadies back in the day it was like you went to green mountain and it, that was it mm-hmm. but now there's still even gravel so maybe people aren't doing cross the season has gotten longer and it's more spread out and then people are finding races in january to do and that was just not really a thing that i had my eye on back in the day how do you manage yeah. that like that's a lot of juggling what's your sort of tactic yeah it's definitely tough because you can't really follow the straight like kind of season plan like that you would just like yeah you race until september or whatever and then you take a three-week break and then start building again for races in march or whatever like yeah you got to kind of take maybe shorter breaks but more of them throughout the season um so i think it's also tough because you can't get dragged into people like whatever other people are doing like yeah you see people going uh it's like january and they're going for a three-week training camp like for me it's probably not the best thing to go do because it's maybe a time where i need to take a break actually instead of be training a ton so Mm -hmm. yeah so how do you stay focused with that with social media and FOMO is real and how do you kind of stay in your own dojo and stay focused on what you're doing as opposed to looking at what the other person's doing yeah it's not it's not easy um but yeah I think you just kind of need to trust the the plan um and yeah as as I've done it kind of a few years now it's getting easier because yeah first it's like oh what am I doing like I should be training right now but now I know what works for me, so it's not too not too hard for me anymore. Uh, so I just have to, yeah, kind of, because I obviously love to train, so that's the hardest part, uh, just kind of getting through it. So I just have to get through it, and then I'm, yeah, then I'm really excited to train. So yeah. do you self coach yourself? Uh, no, uh, my coach, I'm coached by Roger Asphalt. Okay, uh, Thincraft so, yeah. and uh, yep. Pretty exactly. legendary up in the northeast, I'd say. As yeah, I, for still sure. racing. Yeah, uh, I think a bit, not as serious, but yeah, still a bit. That's awesome. So, when you guys are training with metric wise, do you use power, heart rate, RPE, a mixture of the three? How do you gauge most of the training sessions? Yeah, definitely a mixture of the three. Um, especially at altitude, like a little bit more RPE and heart rate because the power just really isn't the same up here. Um, but yeah, like if you're doing like specific stuff, like it's power. Uh, and then and then a lot of like on endurance rides, I like to use heart rate. Um, so yeah, and then of course, like a bit of RPE. So yeah. Cool. With the, How do you shift the training based on the demands of a cross season and a road season? Because you're not to gas you road you're pretty good at everything so i don't know maybe you're like hey i'm just fast i'm just going to keep it the same or do you change it up based on the discipline and the time of the year yeah i think like i get so much like intensity work just from racing cross Mm -hmm. that i don't really find that i need to train that all that much Uh, i almost most of my training is like kind of just like endurance in zone three and then like of course as the races get closer like just sharpening up a bit but yeah i definitely have like a good intensity like base just from racing cross Mm -hmm. so i think that helps a lot so going a little bit when you say like endurance with a little zone three because zone three i think has a bad 
rap these days with polarized being like quote unquote what everyone's doing and people hear zone three and like oh that's, what are you doing in zone three what how does that apply to your rides yeah like i think if it's hilly like it's almost always like riding a kind of like a low zone three on the climbs and then um it's almost closer to zone one everywhere else because like around here you can't you can't ride zone two on the descents really it's like mm -hmm. it's just too turny or whatever um mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like a lot, like a lot of, I mean, if it's like a harder day, yeah, it's kind of zone three whenever you're climbing and then almost just do whatever when you're not. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Cause I've been doing a lot of thinking about this uh, just from the train aspect. Now, like when, we, when I was on Menden, you can just gas all day, mm -hmm. like no coasting. And now I'm in North Carolina where, as you're saying, it's way more twisty turny, you know, yeah. percent descends where you you can pedal if it's like sh straight shot. But so mm -hmm. I've noticed more tempo, more zone one. How does that affect endurance? So yeah, I appreciate you shining some light on kind of your thought process of that. So if you have, do you have like a week to week metric in terms of volume that you guys shoot for since you're not really maybe less focused on intensity or is there a number in the back of your head uh no not so much like i i mean it feels good when you see a big number at the end of the week for me um but yeah like it's usually between it can be for me still anywhere between like 15 and like 28 hours really so mm -hmm. um quite a broad range of course like depending if it's a recovery week coming off like a large racing block but i would say when i'm training it's usually above 20 like when i'm in a training phase mm -hmm. uh so yeah what yeah. are your rest weeks like and you had mentioned when you take a break do the break mm -hmm. weeks in between the disciplines of racing differ from a normal rest week when you're just straight on training yeah yeah for sure like like i take like two two like breaks and they're both like usually two weeks and that was just no bike at all for those mm. two weeks but then yeah like if it's like still in season it's just like a normal like recovery week it's just like kind of shorter uh, like two hour rides or even three hour but just low low intensity like zone one yeah zone one and yeah low zone two okay yeah. uh do you prefer to ride solo or get the gang together and go on like a chain gang ripper what's your just personal preference uh i think solo personally but yeah, of course. I I do love like a good hard group group smash uh with the guys or whatever. Yeah, that's a uh, a funny question. People are like, oh man, I've been reading about this guy AJ. Did you used to ride with him? I'm like, when I moved from Rochester, I think AJ was like nine or ten. So no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. But, but you got to ride with Magnus a lot, right? I read he he's been like a big inspiration for you. Did you guys get to yeah we, in upstate? Yeah, we didn't really and like get to train or race together that much because by the time like I was at more of a serious level he was kind of like he's like off to Europe like he didn't really live okay. in Rochester anymore yeah so we not we didn't really train that much together but I think now like with me kind of coming into that world a bit more I hope we can train a bit more and of course like yeah like he's a huge idol of mine like yeah living like five minutes from me and like seeing what he's been able to do so yeah did that just proximity make your own dream a little bit more tangible? Like, okay, this guy's doing it. This is actually possible. It's not just these European riders that you had to look up to. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it didn't, I still made it, it was still like a huge, huge step. Like I could like Magnus is just such a freak of like freak on the bike. So like, it's still hard to really comprehend what he's doing, but yeah, I think a little bit, it makes it a bit easier to think about like seeing what he like the steps that he's had have to take sort of so yeah so if you had to pick would you be picking a stage race or a one day race yeah i'd say i'd say a stage race um most i mean i like one day races as well but i think stage races usually suit suit me a bit more like usually one days aren't it have like don't really have like the long climbs that i like um but yeah and like i just like the wearing kind of multiple days of a stage race as well so hmm. yeah do you get in the gym or do you think it's not worth your time no i i do get in the gym i think it's worth it especially like nowadays like everybody seems so fit it's so hard to just ride everybody off your 
wheel or whatever like so many of these races are coming down to a sprint now like you see in the pros like there'll be 20k mountain and i'll still be a group of 10 guys left together sprinting it so if you really want to win uh i think you have to be in the gym are you trying to do that all year round or how does that sort of change throughout the year yeah it's mostly in the winter and um like i like i said i take like the breaks and mm -hmm. sometimes it's during those phases i'm in the gym more heavily but yeah i like to work in like light stuff maybe like once once a week or twice a week during season even so yeah what are you doing in the gym when it's the winter time what's your like bit main lifts that you like to do that you find are applicable to your riding yeah i mean i, I like i think squats are like the best for me like or any like sort of squat like doesn't need to be like with the bit like with the bar it could be like a like a split squat or any like variation of it, I think really works for me. Um, or like step ups. I think those are like my main, main, uh, go-to ones in the gym. Mm, cool. Yeah. What's so out in France now, what's the rest of 2023 race calendar looking like for you that you know of, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have a tour of Val Rame coming up starting, july 12th which is they kind of call it like the junior tour de france so mm -hmm. that's five days in the french alps um starting july 12th and then after that i have another stage stage race two weeks after in the netherlands um and that's right before like the big goal of the season which is uh the world championships which is the first week of august for the road race and then uh, i think the second second week of august is the time trial that, and that's probably the biggest goal of the season. Where is that this year? That's in Glasgow, uh, Scotland. Oh, that's right. That's right. How is the course out? Have Do you have any, like, initial vibes of how that day mm. is going uh, to go? Yeah, I was actually fortunate to get up there in May and actually preview some of the, some of the courses. And, yeah, the road race is quite something, like, not typical uh, world champion chip course by any stretch of the imagination I, I don't know if you remember like the Leuven world championships um vaguely quite like a city circuit yeah it's I think it's similar to that I think it was one of the Belgian riders was up there um previewing and they described it as 10 times worse than Leuven in the fact of like how turny and tight it is so wow I think the road race doesn't have a straightaway longer than 500 meters. Wow. But, That's crazy. Yeah. yeah so it's like, keep going. Oh yeah. It's like, it's just like, yeah, it just turns constantly. Then like, there's like maybe five to 10, like short steep hills, but really nothing longer than 20, 30. Seconds. Um, That's so crazy. I envision just like a totally strung out race. Like, you better get at the front or you're probably never going to see it again. Yeah. Did you do um, so. nationals when it was in Kentucky back in tw maybe 2016? I want to say. No, I didn't. It, it would, the road race was in a huge park. It was like my nightmare. It, yeah. Uh, same thing. I think the only straightaway was like a slight downhill, very short amount of time. Uh, mm. Daniel Holloway won. It was like a long crit. It was like a four and a half hour crit. I was my yeah, eyes, that's like this is yeah. insanely hard for me because cornering is my low level. <laughs> I'm like this mm. is the worst course ever. So yeah. do you think that can that play well for you? I mean, yeah, I think I think it can. Um, I think the cornering is good for me. I think the biggest thing for me will just be like positioning, really, because I think, mean, but I think that's the same for everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. and then. Yeah, like it, it seems like a crit, but like the race is still three hours. So it's like a three hour crit is a lot different than a one hour crit. So I think it'll still be very wearing. And I think it'll still be kind of the same group of riders. Like I don't think it's really made for a sprinter, maybe in the pros, but in the juniors, I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, just because of how wearing the race will end up be end up being. So you mentioned uh, in another article, just the aggressive nature of racing in Europe being something you kind of had to adjust to. And I'm sure as mm. you continue to move up in the level of racing, it's going to be something that might be top of mind. What have you done to prepare yourself for that or to improve on that? And do you think it is a physical aspect or, or like the mental side of it's just 
140 guys mm-hmm. and everybody wants to be in that front group. Um, how do you, how have you sort of approached that? Yeah, it's definitely a bit of both. Like definitely you need to have like a lot of physical, like physically you need to have like a big, like just like raw acceleration to like follow attacks mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But you also have to know, like you're still not going to be able to follow everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that comes with experience. Like, you have to know who really is worth following when they attack. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think a bit of both. Um, and I think, yeah, as I've done more races, it's been easier because I know the competition a lot better. So I can kind of choose who I follow and choose who we uh like let dangle. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I was gonna ask you that. You know, I've never. I was looking through. You've raced all over the world, and a lot of things that I think as amateurs, we learn here in the U S even as you start to go to regional races, you kind of start to know the names, but that's really like mm-hmm. a corner of the U S if I went to New Mexico and raced, I don't know anybody over there. How right. long was it until you start to like, was it all very random racing at first? Like when did you kind of learn who mm-hmm. everyone was and maybe did you have to do any research beforehand to understand who is like the top dogs and who eh, right. where did that guy go? Yeah. Yeah, like, of course, it comes with experience like, all the races you do and, yeah, like, a bit of research. But I think I didn't truly, like, know it until, like, I did this race in Czech Republic called Corsa de la Pe. And that's, like, a what they call, like, a Nations Cup. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, like, that's, like, when you really know everybody because essentially all the best riders are there. Mm -hmm. And, like, yeah, even if you're at, like, a normal UCI junior race, not not every European is going to be there. So it's, like... Yeah, you get, you know, yeah, you know, more riders every race. You can so. figure it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it takes time though. Yeah. So, what have you learned about cycling over the years that's made you better at cycling? Yeah, I think just like knowing when to really play your cards and uh, spend all your energy. Like, I think what, especially like from a cross background, like. And cross, yeah, you just go as hard as you can from the very beginning. Um, but in road, that's not what you do really. Um, and I, when I start, first started racing road, that's what I did because I didn't know any better. But yeah, and I, as it's as I've road raced, like I've learned, yeah, you kind of have like one or two really big blows to take, and that's it. Um, and I think yeah, and at, as the level goes up, that is just keeps becoming more apparent so that's probably the biggest thing so what would maybe be a piece of advice for you know cat three four that might not be understanding that because this is it, it's hard for some people to get that like wait a minute what do you mean one to two blows like what do you mm-hmm. experience is obviously probably the biggest thing that helps with that but how do you focus on reading the race and it is a gamble like there's no real right answer but i'm just curious how do you think about that or what it, was there any race where you learned something like you went you're like oh damn that was not the move or like there you know it's uh it's a tough thing to maybe put into words but is is it possible yeah yeah i think it's yeah tough to put in words i think maybe one of the best things you can do to learn it is like even train with people who are stronger than you because mm-hmm. like yeah maybe you'll be able to really go with them the first two three hours of the ride but in the fourth and fifth hour you're probably going to get slammed by them so mm-hmm. i think just like just like it happening to you once or twice and you'll probably realize uh what it's like um yeah did you get to do g tour training races at all when you're in rochester yeah yeah i mean i don't do many of them anymore but yeah i used to do them all the time like especially like during covid like I think because mm-hmm. they were still happening, not like right at the start of uh the pandemic, but like right. I think like later in the summer, uh, I was able to do like pretty much every week. I've always that referenced good. that to athletes that struggle with racing or who might have four mm-hmm. races on their race calendar. Like, okay, this is my A race. I'm like, okay, well, this is your first race of the year. So it's really hard for this to be like your priority. You haven't raced. And so right. having G Tour the reason I want to bring this up is for athletes that might hear this podcast and it's a training race every week and you get to go and just cut your chops and try different things. And if you don't have something like Mm. that, 
get your buddies together and figure out a way to like do some race sims because there's no better way to learn those things that you're talking about than actually going through them and having a way to kind of, like you said, you learn the lessons a couple of times and you're like, okay, don't do that again. Um, right. I just think we're so fortunate to have that type of community that everybody doesn't have it. Did you feel like those were extremely valuable? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Like, especially when I was doing, I'm like, I wasn't, like when I first started doing, them, wasn't like so strong that I was able to just like kind of just ride off. Yeah. Um, like, so yeah, like I think doing that, those like helped me like, cause like I wasn't that serious in the road racing when I first started doing those, but um, I think it helped me like get a sense of like that before I really started doing more competitive stuff on the road. Dude, if you are, I, I'm sure it's definitely not top priority, but if you can go back to G Tour when you're in town, I'm sure people would love to see you there. So I'll put that bug in your ear. And I'm sure other yeah, people yeah. might tell you the same thing, but it's like if AJ August yeah. shows up, you don't have to kill I him, sure. but it would be super inspiring to people. Yeah, I went to one of the um one of the TTs, but I was like, I think if it's better to go one of the road races, it's a bigger turnout. Um, totally. so, yeah, I think I will, uh, probably put one on my calendar at, once I get back, uh, later this summer. So. What, what do you think is, uh, your best attribute in cycling and how do you use that to your advantage? Yeah. Um, I mean, I know I'm like, I'm quite a light rider, so it's like, I'm good on the climbs, but it's not always like, like going away on the climb. It can just be like saving energy on the climb and then when we come to the final i'm much fresher than uh the rest of the guys because i didn't have to blow a big match getting over it mm. um but yeah obviously it could just be that i that i go away on a climb but um yeah i think that for sure on the other side of the coin what do you think is the thing that you want to improve most on this year yeah um i would say just positioning in like these european races like it's not easy and you could never really like relax in the race like there's not one guy in the field who wants to be at the back um ever so yeah they always if you're not going forward you're getting passed pretty much mm -hmm. uh so i think yeah that's it's like i'm i'm getting better at it but i think yeah there's still some room for improvement and is that what go even more granular like is it that you get lax and all of a sudden you're like oh my god i'm in the middle of the pack again or is it the way that you're moving through the group or can you verbalize yeah in any i other think way? yeah i think for me a lot of times it's actually like a lapse of focus um which it's okay sometimes it's just that if it's a key point in the race yeah you got to be at the front um like there's a few points uh or a few times in races this uh year already like where I wasn't in the best position in coming and take a, one of the like, hardest climbs, like a key point in the race. Um, and uh, yeah, like some of the favorites started attacking. Fortunately, I had the legs to still close the gap that they had established um, from when I was a little bit farther back in the pack. But yeah, as the level, level gets high, you're, you're just not able to do that. Um, so yeah, because like you never know. I mean, yeah, I was able to close it, but maybe I could have gone by myself if I didn't have to spend that match to close the gap that I that I uh that had been created when I was a little bit too far back in the peloton. Yeah, makes sense. What yeah. is is there anything in your daily routine that you're pretty religious with that you feel like has a big return to your success mm. in life or in cycling? Yeah, I think just going to bed early and just having a good sleep routine is just pretty uh key for me like yeah just sleeping well every night going to bed at a similar time yeah i think that's the biggest thing like super what, important what time do you go to bed and what's a good duration of sleep for you where you're like okay this is normal yeah i usually try to like go to bed before like lights out uh not on my not like yeah i well i usually try to put my phone away like a half hour before i go to bed anyways but yeah, like lights out like 9 30 mm -hmm. uh is around when I do that. Um, and then yeah, for like total sleep, I usually try to get like nine hours, not like nine hours in bed, but nine hours of actual like sleep. Sleepy. So that usually equates to like more like 10 hours in bed. So if I go to bed at nine, yeah, nine 30, wake up around seven thirty eight is typical for me. Cool. 
Yeah. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? And again, doesn't have to be cycling specific, but maybe something for life, either, either route. Yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah, it's for cycling. I think go, go fast, not hard, which is like, hmm. maybe I, I'll have to elaborate a bit. Yeah. Like, um, I think uh, for like TTs, especially this is important, but like going, um, spending all your energy on a flat section is and say it's like a hilly tt that's not where you're gonna go the fastest like if you really invest more energy on the hills and maybe go a little bit easier on the flat the the time like that you'll save is much greater than just riding a really steady pace i think a lot of new cyclists get wrapped into the thought that oh yeah it's a tt i gotta ride a really steady pace but i think it's the one of the biggest mistakes because um yeah like the time like you can save so much more time going from 20 to 25k an hour opposed to going 50 to 55k an hour like Mm -hmm. the time saved is much greater so i think that's a that's a big one for sure do you do any training rides by speed where it's like just go fast i wouldn't say rides but like when i like when i'm doing like tt intervals like i'm thinking how do i and it's on like a flat course or like sometimes you know like the rush tt course for example um like i think yeah how do i go faster at like and you can see like i'll be going maybe in like a five minute section i can gain at the same average and like average power or even pretty similar normalized power i can save like like five ten seconds 15 seconds in a five minute section no problem Mm -hmm. riding the same same effort level, just putting it down in slightly different ways. So would you say, I think it's a really important point that you make because it's the, the average pacing and people, I think sometimes get too caught up in Watts per kg for a whole duration, as opposed to looking at the courses undulating. Would you say, I mean, you're a guy that gets away in road races. Are you pacing that the same way with like, Hey, I need to surge hard over this climb, get out of sight. Like what's your mindset when you shift to a road race and you're trying to get away by yourself? Yeah. I think once, if you're solo in a road race, I think the exact same like thing applies. Like it's, Mm. you got to, the pacing wise, you got to pace it like a TT, like, yeah, go harder. It's essentially it's go harder when you're going slower is the gist of it. So yeah. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So what do you do when things aren't going great for AJ? You're not feeling like you're riding mm-hmm. too well. You're feeling a little flat. Is there something that you're like, okay, this is co- sort of my like reset button? Yeah. I mean, I think like the best thing for me to do is just like talk to my coach. Uh, but obviously it's not the only thing you can do. Like, yeah, I think just like, I I don't really think you ever lose anything by taking like, one two days off the bike like in the short term in the short short term like it's probably the best thing like especially mentally sometimes so yeah what do you think you get from that coaching relationship what do you like what do you hit him up with you're like yo roger i'm just not feeling yeah good. like what's the, yeah, what's the point of good. having a coach yeah like i mean he can look at a lot of things like my metrics like i like i wear the whoop he's like oh maybe this is not like like not right or whatever and like of course he looks at all the training i've been doing and maybe he can notice like variations in anything mm-hmm. or like sometimes it could be like even like like the weather like say it's well yeah aj it's been really hot lately that could totally explain why you're not feeling as well so mm-hmm. that second set of eyes they see some i i, I want to know what this is but like there's so many athletes that have been have mentioned things like this of like just someone else pointing out something that's very basic, but like when you're in the midst of your own training and race, and I think sometimes mm. the stuff can be easy to overlook and it's like, it can be a mess with the mind. Yeah. 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 For sure. Let's talk about nutrition for a second. What are you doing on the bike? Does it, and I'm, there's like a million questions I want to ask you. Does it differ cross to road? Are you pretty consistent with what you're doing on the bike or how does that break down for you? Yeah, I mean, it definitely differs. I wouldn't say between cross and road necessarily, but I think it just depends on intensity and duration of the ride. Like, I mean, for like, if I'm doing like a intense interval session, like I want to really be fueling like pretty high carbs, like probably 80 grams an hour. Um, But yeah, but then like if it's just like an endurance ride, like not any really hard efforts, just 
pretty steady, I can kind of like back it off to like 30, 40 grams an hour and like feel good on that. So, um, yeah, cause I, I like to, and for me, like I like to eat a lot off the bike as well. So, um, sometimes like, but I, I know it's always better to kind of fuel on the bike. So, um, yeah. Are you liquid carbs? Are you eating food on the bike? Where mm -hmm. do you put that? Yeah, that kind of is goes hand in hand with what I just said. Like I like like if it's like if I'm not really trying to like pound a ton of carbs, mm -hmm. like I I like to go like more eating the carbs, um, in a form like a bar or whatever, even it maybe even stop at a cafe, um, for like a pastry or whatever. Um, but yeah, then like if it's really high high intensity, I'll be slamming the high carb mix and gels so yeah so if you go on like a five hour ride you want to take on like 150 grams of carbs i would say if it's that if it's that long i'm definitely higher i think okay i think it wants like a long ride maybe like there's certain sections where i'm only doing 30 40 but then maybe all the stops well where i'll take on like a lot of carbs at once mm. um okay. so i think if you told it, it's almost for five hours it's like closer to the 200 250 grams uh okay. for the whole thing yeah. wow what's are you big into cycling tech at all yeah i am big into it um like especially with the tt stuff more but yeah so um, well, obviously it's important in a tt but do you get it super into the aero game with the road bike or is it more tt focus and what do you kind of what's yeah what are you for, big into for, for aero, I definitely focus. I don't focus too much on aero, like on my road setup. Um, I just, I don't know. I think I should because it's. I think that's definitely underrated. Um, but um, but yeah, like it's kind of just easier to focus on aero for your TT bike because that's what you kind of think about first, like when you think about TT. Um, so yeah, I'm quite into the, like the aero on the TT bike what are some of the latest changes in the past couple of years maybe that you've made or things that you feel have made you more aero on the TT bike? Yeah. I mean, I think right now I'm running like the aero coach cockpit, um, for the extensions. And then I also like, as the last few years, my kind of setup has gotten better. Like I'm, I think I'm riding one of the fastest bikes you can have now, like the Pinarello TT bike with the full Princeton, uh, front wheel and princeton disc wheel so yeah i think it's pretty pretty optimal there you going in a wind tunnel ever no but i think soon uh i think i think that might be something that's a little bit overrated as well like it's pretty easy to do testing not in a wind tunnel and um wind tunnel testing as well like it's a lot a lot of times like it's hard to really get accurate because a lot of guys will like sit out 100 watts not a position they can hold that threshold in the wind tunnel so i think mm -hmm. outdoor testing and actually testing when you're riding like yeah like your tt pace is quite important mm, that's a good yeah. point what so are you going on the same how do you do this outside you go on the same day same place and just fiddling with things and because you obviously need like similar wind or what's your sort of pro yeah level? yeah you can do like a find like a small loop and just like try to ride it similar power and um and you'll it's maybe it's not like scientifically that accurate, but like, yeah, you'll be able to really in the end of, at the end of the day, you'll be able to see what's kind of working for you and what's not. I mean, you make a good point. It might not be quote unquote scientifically accurate, but it's real world accurate. And I think kind of jumping topics, Andy Coggin, who's a name I'm sure, you know, mm -hmm. uh, had done a podcast with this guy on inside exercise and Coggin is a huge science guy. And he's talking about mm -hmm. how, real world and performance is the best uh predictor of performance and there's so many people i shouldn't say that there's a lot of people though that it's like what's the study show me the science da -da -da, this isn't backed up by this data and it's like well there's not a study for everything and everything can't be si like science is really important right. but you gotta actually be able to do it on the bike so it's interesting to mm -hmm. hear that um so okay underrated arrow overrated wind tunnel um yeah so I, I wouldn't say the wind tunnel is necessarily overrated, but I think it's not necessary in some okay. respects. Cause yeah. Yeah. So what's overrated like, cycling? Uh, wait, um, let's go in on because, that. Cause you're super light guy. Well, well, I think for amateurs, it's overrated, uh, at least like, cause like the races, like most of the races I've seen the amateur level, like 
like the hills aren't that big or that steep for the most part. Mm-hmm. Riding here, like in like say you're right like doing the Tour de France and like riding these mountains, yeah, weight's definitely super important. But mm-hmm. not not many amateur races or like even junior races do climbs like this. Um, so yeah, and you can still have really high watts per kilogram at maybe not your peak weight. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. So I think even too, it's even, it's been shown like if the gradient is five or 6% Watts per kg doesn't even determine that it's like, where do you put out the Watts and where is the, yeah. similar to what you're talking about before? Like, do you surge hard at the right time? And now it's, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, weight is Robin Carpenter brought this up. He's like, I wish more people would talk about, uh, Watts versus CDA as opposed to Watts per kg. And it's, yeah, exactly. You know, I don't, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's de- weight's definitely important. Like, right. when it gets really hilly, but like, for the most part, like, it's not most of the races like in the U.S. and like junior races and amateur races aren't aren't incredibly hilly. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think. Would you agree with this? I think a, a middle ground that I've tried to find for myself and for other athletes. I'm like, well, what is my weight? I said, okay, look in the mirror. Do you, do you look like you could lose weight? And then also to sort of flip the coin, like go pick up a five pound bag of sugar and imagine riding with that. Like five pounds matters. It's a yeah. lot of weight, yeah, yeah. but you know, like just be reasonable with it. Don't obsess over it. And if you feel like, man, okay, I'm a little pudgy. Like I could lose a little weight. Like mm-hmm. that's just like a good baseline, like without, so people don't get too like overthinking it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's perfect. Like, I think, yeah, you don't have to obsess to, over it, but, and, like, I think if you're training well and, like, eating, like, good, mm-hmm. the weight usually comes along with it, mm-hmm. um, at least for me, but, yeah. What is good eating for you off the bike? Yeah, I like to, like, really focus on, like, my pre and post, like, like the, like, breakfast before I train, and then if it's lunch or maybe sometimes dinner if I train later, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I like to focus like quite well on those meals, like to get in, yeah, the right amount of carbs before and after. But then, like for di- say dinner wasn't my meal, that's immediately after training. That can be like a bit, bit more fun and just like kind of whatever. Like my family fixes up for dinner, mm-hmm. I can just I can be fine with that. Like, um, yeah. You've been, you've done some gravel races before and crushed some, obviously. And a lot of times those start super early. So if you're focused on breakfast, do you try and still eat a lot before a big gravel ride? Or say you had mm-hmm. 7 a.m. start for something, how would you approach that? Yeah, I think if it's the race starts really early in the morning, I would almost focus more on like a heavier dinner the night before and just like top. And then in the morning, yeah, just like top off the book and you, glycogen stores like uh like for me i notice like if i eat too much before a ride or a race my in my stomach just feels like like all the blood is in my stomach and not my legs sometimes um so that's actually like quite important um and i think yeah i think a lot of people like overdo the pre-race meal a lot of, or pre-race yeah like yeah pre-race meal and i think a lot of times it's more just topping off what like you had for dinner the night before and yeah you don't need to go crazy awesome what is what's your biggest inspiration right now for you kind of pushing forward it's you've you're in a really unique position you're super high level rider there's a lot going on of people are already talking maybe more about your own future than you think of yourself but like what keeps Mm. you going on yeah i think it's really quite easy for me because it's just like i can see the possibility of like doing what I love and just like turning that into a career and like almost feeling yeah like I never have to really work a day in my life so that's really the inspiration I think that's awesome what on the flip side I mean you've got to have a ton of people telling you what you do, need to do hey AJ you got to do this mm-hmm. hey, AJ, you got how do you kind of take in some of that information but sort of stay focused on your plan and how do you you know is it do you talk to your family about this? Do you talk to your coach? Like who's sort of like your sounding board? Mm-hmm. Of, I mean, it's amazing what's sitting in front of you. It's got to be a little overwhelming at times. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. 
No, it is. And I think the best thing like I can do for that just like is kind of just like keep a pretty close circle. Mm. And then like sometimes maybe someone like that I'm not maybe not in my circle, I guess, doesn't like nobody really is informed on a, like such a topic. And sometimes I need to ask and I think ask somebody outside my circle and find out from them. Mm. But yeah, like I like to keep it like pretty close and then just, yeah, do my thing. And I at this point. Like I know it works for me pretty well and I don't like to, yeah, like take in too much and just kind of just keep it pretty limited because yeah, it can get, it's easy to get in your head. Like when you got like 20 people telling you what to do, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> what can you finish this sentence? Uh, I never dot, dot, dot. Yeah. I wouldn't say I never, because I do like to listen. I, I mean, you have to listen to your body, but I, I very rarely like would go under like my prescribed like ride time, even if it's by like a few minutes. I'm always it's like four hour ride. I'm doing four or three or something. Like I don't know, just mentally for me, it looks a lot better than three fifty nine. Um, and I know a lot of people are different, but for me, like, just like I need like mentally, I need I can't do that <laughs> like going <laughs> just like a minute under. <laughs> I love this man. There's always like a line that I want to clip out because I got. For, you know, we coach, you know, a lot of amateur athletes and I was once talking to this guy and kept always cutting his ride short. I said, Hey man, if you went from eight hours a week to nine hours, that's a 12 and a half percent increase in training time. He's like, wait, okay. That math is kind of crazy. And I said, if you have a four hour ride scheduled and you go home at three hours and 50 minutes, I, I think I have this right. That's actually a 3% reduction in training, which to me, it's only 10 minutes. Right. But like, yeah it all matters and it all adds up. You mm. cut 10 minutes here, you cut 15 here. So I love that, man. Stick to the plan, finish the yeah. duration. That is, that's clutch. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Yeah. Like if I, I just can't feel like mentally like, yeah, satisfied really. If I do whatever a few minutes less, like, I don't know, just doesn't, this is how I work, I guess, but stick to it, yeah. man. It's working. It's working. Yeah, man. Um, all right. This is a, this is kind of a wide open sort of big one. Top three skills for success for AJ. Yeah. Um, I think a good one for me is like not getting hung up on say a bad result or even, uh, maybe even a bad training session. Hmm. Um, how do you move past that? What do you, are you like, whatever it's one day or what's your coping skill? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Like whatever it's one day, like, um, and like, for me, like I've never really had a time where it's like a prolonged amount of time where it's like, Oh, I'm really not feeling good or whatever. Like usually I can bounce back pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not too bad. So I usually, yeah, usually it's just like, yeah, let's, uh, get a, let's just focus on tomorrow. Um, and then, yeah. Um, I wait. Can you repeat the question? Actually, for just some like reason, things, I just... uh, skills for success, like things that you either learn oh, yeah, yeah. or things that you're doing that you're like, all right, this really helps me along my path. Yeah, I think like a good like relationship with your teammates as well, because mm. um, first of all, like they're gonna make you better physically, and then like if you really if you want them to help you in the races, I think. Um, yeah, you got to be on their good side. Um, and like, if you're, if you're really good friends with your teammates, like they're going to do everything they can to help you in the race. And then yeah, vice versa, like you helping them. So, mm. yeah. Um, let me ask you a question on that because this is yeah. actually a question that gets asked by a lot of amateurs that you maybe not had, had had to deal with, but they always say, how do I know what team to join? And my response is usually, who do you, who would you hang out with off the bike? Who do you like? Who's, who do you think is like, Hey, mm. be my friend. Do you think that's a good answer mm. to give people? Or would you add anything to that when someone's like, Hey, what team should I join? I think people join a team because they get this percent discount or they get this. Uh, I'm like, no, don't look at that stuff. Who is your crew? Do you think that's a yeah. good piece? Yeah. Of I crew? think it's who's going to make you better. Like, who are you going to really want to go out and smash with like on the bike? Like, cause that physically that's going to be the best for you. Like you're mm -hmm. going to get the most out of your training. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, like also just like who you like to hang out with, mm -hmm. um, is going to help because the fact is like, you're not going to want to hang out with them if you, if you don't like them. So, right. Yeah. 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 And you're not going to want to, if you want to, if you have to go to the race, you're not going to be that motivated to go when you know it's going to be miserable. So that's yeah. huge. What are you up to when you're not riding? 
Uh, not much to be honest, but, um, <laughs> recovering, but, sleeping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I, I, I'm don't have too much of a life to be honest off the bike. Um, but yeah, I do like, like when I'm taking a break, like in the winter, I like, like Nordic skiing. Um, and yeah, like even I play some golf in the summer. If I'm not doing not so much anymore because my summers are usually pretty packed, but yeah, if I have like a little lighter time, I like to get out uh for some golf or yeah just anything like you, that you got it right and aj just looked out the window or something you have the most savage chin strap that right on oh, the table <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> as you can tell not much us than riding <laughs> what's um one last one for you and you've already given a ton of gems already but there's a rider somewhere that's listening to this it's like man this guy's super inspiring and maybe a younger rider or even someone who's your age and is trying to get to where you're at what's the best piece of advice for a cyclist trying to get to where aj is mm-hmm. yeah i think for like a slightly lower level cyclist like focus less on like power and stuff like that and focus more on like learning good tactics and how to kind of maneuver peloton and yeah you know, like actually win a race like and i think the best thing to do is like instead of maybe doing like a really structured interval session, maybe you can go out and just do like a competitive group ride or something like we mentioned, like the G tour, like local training series, like, cause like you're still going to get a mega workout in mm-hmm. and you're also going to develop your race craft and uh, everything that goes with racing with racing. So I think that's a big one. That's awesome. I think it's, yeah, I'm going to let you leave that there. Any parting words for the listeners? Oh, my last question actually is what's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? I know you're on Instagram. Do you use Twitter or blog or anything else like that? Yeah, I would say Instagram. Uh, actually, you, you you saying that reminds me that I need to kind of get back on the posting and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I'd say Instagram and also uh, Strava is good as well. Um, so is uh like posting is that not your natural tendency are you more you seem more a quiet kind of personal guy is that yeah i'm definitely like a bit of yeah i'm definitely like a little bit more quiet on instagram um even though like i spend probably way too much time looking on instagram like (laughs) myself i'm a i'm a i'm a pretty quiet poster but um and there's not really a reason behind it um more than just you yes yeah Yeah, that's cool that's cool yeah hey man thank you so much for doing this everybody i'll post aj's instagram and you can find him on strava keep up keep up with what he's doing and looking forward to seeing some big results and we'll catch you all soon